Well, you can open your Bibles to the book of Leviticus, and we're in chapter 11 this morning. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank You for Your Word, and we believe what You say about it, that all of it is breathed out by You and is profitable for us. So we believe that every word is true, and we're so grateful that You've given us this book that most ultimately presents Yourself to us in Jesus. And so we pray that You would open the eyes of our heart to behold Your glory in Jesus and to win more of our affection for You to transform us to live holy lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, we're continuing in our series in the book of Leviticus this morning, and we come to Leviticus 11 today. If you don't have a Bible, you can grab one around the chairs nearby, and Leviticus 11 is on page 88 and 89 in those Bibles. And this chapter is about Israel's kosher food loss. It's about the animals that Israelites could or couldn't eat. And it's one of the chapters that may seem most irrelevant to us today. Uh, If you were making it through Leviticus in your Bible reading plan, you made it to chapter 11, that might have been the the place where you said, I've had enough. Um, And this is also used to discredit Christians, right? An objection is, well, you pick and choose the text you care about. You pick and choose what you're going to obey, right? Do you eat shellfish? Did you have bacon this morning? Well, then who are you to say that this thing's wrong? So why is it important then that we consider this? Well, first of all, because we want to give, uh, as Francis Schaeffer used to say, honest answers to honest questions. Christians should always want to do that. People have honest questions. We should give honest answers. We should want to deal with this. Are we being hypocritical or picking and choosing things and arbitrary in what we decide we're obeying in the Bible? Are we actually the ones who are actually really just obeying ourselves in that sense because we get to pick and choose what we want? Uh, or is there uh, something going on in the Bible itself that gives guidance for what, how, how this applies to our lives? But it's also important because Leviticus is a symbol-laden system that points forward to Jesus. Ultimately, every part of the Bible is about Jesus. And there are deep principles that still apply to us today from this very text. So here's a story that makes this point. Uh, Jay Sklar is a Leviticus, Leviticus scholar with a pretty cool last name who teaches at Covenant Theological Seminary in St. Louis. And he shared about one of the assignments he has his students do when they are going through Leviticus. He has them take a week to try to obey every law they can for that week from Leviticus and then journal about their experience. And many students find that it's pretty frustrating But then he said, one of the most common observations is something like this. Every day, so this would be their kind of journal. Every day I made decisions about ritual purity and impurity. By midweek, I realized I was thinking about these things all day long and in every aspect of my life, and that's when it hit me. God cares a lot about our purity and holiness. Not just from a ritual perspective, but also from a moral perspective perspective. All day long and in every aspect of life, the Lord wants me to pursue purity in my heart, in my life, in my actions. He wants me to reflect His holiness in all that I do. I've been treating holiness way too lightly. Oh, Lord, help me to be holy. God wants us to reflect His holy character in all that we do all through the day. That's the point of the text we're looking at today, ultimately. The point of the chapter comes at the end in verse 45. We're going to read the whole, or parts of the chapter as we go, uh, but look at verse 45 with me. I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy for I am holy. So this chapter teaches us to be holy because I am holy. Verse 45 is the point. 
So the tabernacle is a mini symbol-laden Eden new creation planted in the midst of this fallen world. We've been seeing that over time in this series. And then Leviticus 1 through 7, just to put this in context, Leviticus 1 through 7 is about the offerings that provide the way back into God's presence. Then Leviticus 8 through 10 is about how the priests represent Israel and are like a new Adam. But last Sunday we saw they repeated Adam's fall into sin. Two priests trivialized God's holiness and they died on the spot. The point is that a holy God requires a holy people who don't trivialize him and trivialize the life that he's given us. Now Leviticus 11 focuses on how to live this life of holiness and purity through the food laws. But this is not about arbitrary distinctions between animals. This is about learning to view all of life through the lens of holiness. God is with them, and so they need to be holy. And here's how it connects with us. This is a symbol-laden diet that pointed forward to Jesus. Jesus came to bring the true cleansing, and he leads us to live lives of true holiness. So what we're going to see here with these distinctions between certain animals that are viewed as clean or pure and unclean and impure is ultimately a diet that teach, taught Israel to live all of life in terms of holiness. And now this teaches us to pursue holiness so that we can reflect God's character and live in his holy presence, not in terms of of the food diet as it's given here, but in terms of all of life. So we'll see this by walking through the text like this. First, uh, making distinctions between creatures. Second, avoiding death and ground swarmers. Third, how Jesus fulfills all these food laws. And then finally, how we live holy lives today. So first, making distinctions between creatures. This is the first 23 verses of the chapter. Israel is to distinguish between clean and unclean animals. This isn't about um, which animals tend to be more dirty than others. Language could actually be used which, is, which are pure and impure in terms of ritual purity. So it's not about dirt and germs. God is giving Israel a diet so that they can live in his presence with a symbolic holiness. God's presence is with them in the tabernacle like a new Eden. Israel is surrounding God's presence, and so they need to have a kind of holiness that reflects God's Edenic presence. And so through this text, there's an emphasis on which animals reflect best creation as it was given. So this text is filled with echoes of the story of Genesis 1 through 3. Not a surprise if you've been here during the series, every text in Leviticus is filled with echoes of Genesis 1 through 3. But this one in some peculiar and helpful ways for understanding what it means. So the first section divides the animal world into three realms. They're the same three realms that God made in Genesis 1. The ground, the sea, and the air, the skies. So first we have the ground creatures here in verses 2 through 8. Clean animals that are able to be eaten are listed first. They're those animals that part the hoof and chew the cud. So verses 2 and 3. These are the living things that you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth. Whatever parts the hoof and is cloven-footed and choose the cud among the animals you may eat. So these would be animals like the ox, sheep, goats, deer, and then the unclean animals are noted. So the clean animals have hooves that have a part in it, and they chew the cud. The unclean animals only do one of those, but not the other. So verses 4 to 6 list those who chew the cud, but don't part the hoof. Camels, rock badgers, hares, then verse 7 lists the pig as one that parts the hoof but doesn't chew the cud. Okay, so that's the first realm, ground. The next realm is the water creatures in verses 9 through 12. Those that are clean and able to be eaten are those that have fins and scales. Verses 9, 9, or chapter 9, verse 9. These you may eat of all that are in the waters. Everything in the waters that has fins and scales, whatever in the seas or in the rivers, you may eat. So then anything that's in rivers or waters or seas or oceans that does not have fins or scales, you can't eat. So like the crab or eel or swarming creatures in the waters. The last realm is the air. 
Among the birds, those that are unclean are in verses 13 to 19. These are eagles, vultures, hawks, ravens, owls, bats, different kinds of those. You can scan those verses to see those. And as we walk through this, we have to ask, what do, what's the commonality there? What do those all have in common? They're essentially all birds of prey, the, the kinds that kill and, or eat dead carcasses. And then there's also insects in this realm of the air. Verse 20 notes that those, those that are unclean, it says all winged insects that go on all fours are detestable to you. So if it has wings, but it has four or more legs, it's unclean. And the exception would be the hoppers, like grasshoppers, locusts, they're okay. So now what are we to make of this? Almost everyone reads this and has two problems with it. The first problem is that it looks overly complicated. Now, I made it actually look less complicated by showing that it actually has these three realms in there and summarized it. But you just, if you just read this straight and you aren't noticing that structure and any of those things, it seems arbitrary. It looks complicated. How are they even going to keep track of this? Does everyone have a little notebook? They see an animal. Can I have this one or not? Does this one weigh how many legs? No, no, that's got six legs, you know. Is that how it was? Well, it actually wouldn't have been that complicated to them. This is how most thing in, things in life actually works. It looks complex until you get used to it, and then it becomes second nature. So I started woodworking the past few years, and so I've been learning about different kinds of wood. Before this, wood was wood. It all looks the same to me. I don't understand the differences. And then when I started to learn about the different kinds, it became a bit overwhelming. I wanted to build something. I'm like, what kind of wood do I need? Apparently, these guys on YouTube say it matters. Don't do it with this wood. You got to have a hard wood, not a soft wood. Okay, what are those? He lays out like 30 pieces in front and just without notes, just starts walking through it all. That's walnut. There's oak there. You know, that's an exotic one from Brazil. That's this. You don't want to use that one for this kind of thing. But if you're making a box, I'd go, you know, it's like, how is he doing this? After a while, you get the hang of it and it makes sense. I was having lunch with one of my sons yesterday, asked him his favorite car these days. I like to keep, keep up with that. And um, I should have known. I was thinking, oh, yeah, it's a Porsche 911, right? I say that, and he's like, no, Porsche 918 Spider twin engine RS. <laughs> and then he started listing his second, third, and fourth favorite cars with similar kinds of uh, information that I didn't even know how, how to process in my head. And I've been tracking with them and watching the YouTube videos with them for some time. Uh, but once you get used to a realm of information and knowledge, it becomes obvious to you. That's how diets work too. This is a diet. That's essentially what this is. I know many of you are on a certain kind of diet, either by choice or necessity. When people first started hearing about the gluten-free diet, it sounded way complicated. I have to avoid gluten. And the first few weeks of that, it was really confusing for me. I found out gluten's in everything. Um, it sounded complicated. And it was funny to watch people try to cook for me. It's like, now you can't have potato chips, right? And I was like, no, I think those are okay. That's just potatoes. Okay, great, because we're having that in pizza. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Doesn't work. Okay. Some of you are on a keto diet or a vegan diet. And it's complicated at first, but then you figure it out. And it's not hard at all. Same thing here. Once you figure out the rationale, it's not that complicated. And once you live in it. But then that leads to the second problem. What is the rationale? Why are some included or not in this diet? Well, there's no consensus on this. There's a number of views that get traction, but I do think that some views are really unlikely. And so I'm gonna make the case for one main view here. So some say that this is arbitrary, that the point really is just to get Israel to obey because God said so. He wanted to show that he's got the authority, so he just picked and choose, chose uh, different animals at random, and that really was the point. You eat this way because God said it. So everything you do in life is just because God said it. Now, I think that is not likely here. That should be the last resort view if there can be no other rationale given. Others say that this is about hygiene. Unclean animals were disease carriers. They didn't know it back then, but we do now. We can look back and say, wow, God was being so kind um, to help them there. But this really doesn't line up with all the animals. And then Jesus came and he said, the distinctions are now gone. Eat whatever you want. So if it was about hygiene, why would that stop mattering? 
Some others lean into the symbolism of this, but they're highly speculative and moralizing with it. So they say that clean animals are the ones that are intended to remind us of some kind of morally good behavior, and the unclean animals remind us of something evil. So those that chew the cud reminds us of how Christians, God's people are to meditate on God's Word, and the image they use is in the Bible is of chewing on Scripture. So those animals remind us of meditating on Scripture. That's why they're good. Pigs are filthy. That reminds us of the filth of sin and evil. We should uh, avoid that and so forth. But here's what I think is the best take. Clean and unclean has to do with the creation narrative. The key to Leviticus is reading it in light of Eden and the first chapters of Genesis. The themes of creation and fall are repeatedly echoed in this text. So here's the insight that I would propose, um, along with others. Something is clean when it is tightly associated with a creational ideal. So the clean animals are the ones that are most normal or fitting in their particular realm. And something is unclean when it doesn't fit well or, or it's associated more with the fall of the world into sin or the curse of death. For example, in the air, creatures, the the ideal would be you have a couple wings and then you have a couple feet for when you land. But what if you have four or more legs? Well, then that makes them too much like a ground creature. So you look at those and you think, hey man, you got to pick. Are you going to be a flyer? Are you going to be a crawler? You've got wings, but you've got like eight legs. Doesn't fit as well. In the waters, the creatures ideally have fins and scales. That's the normal mode of propulsion there. So the animals that don't conform to those most normal or ideal standards are viewed as impure. They don't fit as well with the others in their class. Not like they're bad or wrong. This is setting up a symbolic world, but because God's creational presence is there, the animals that most naturally and ideally fit that are the best fit. And so the other thing that makes some animals unclean is their association, it seems, with the curse of death. So all the birds that are mentioned were carnivores. They kill or feed on carcasses. They're viewed as killers, blood drinkers, associated with death. So humans aren't supposed to do that, and so they shouldn't eat the animals that do. So that makes sense in light of what we've seen so far in Leviticus. This tabernacle is God's new creation in the midst of the fallen world. God's presence in the tabernacle, and this new Eden is pure and clean and perfect. And so now it's in the midst of Israel. And so as the Israelites are all around this new creational presence of God, they have to be associated with it. And so this theme develops more in the next section. The theme of death becomes even more prominent. So the second section is about avoiding death and ground swarmers. So first, death. Touching a dead animal makes someone unclean. So this is verses 24 to 27. You can read it with me. And by these you shall become unclean. Whoever touches their carcass shall be unclean until the evening. And whoever carries any part of their carcass shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. Every animal that parts the hoof but is not cloven-footed or does not chew the cud is unclean for you. Everyone who touches them shall be unclean. So if you touch a carcass, you have to wash your clothes, and then you're viewed as ritually and symbolically unclean until the evening for the rest of the day. Well, what if a mouse makes it into your house and dies there? That was a lot more common then uh, than it is now in, in their situation. So what do they do? What happens if you've got a dead animal in the house? Well, later in the chapter, God deals with all sorts of scenarios like that. You have to clean and destroy or destroy various things that the dead animal was touching. So Israel is living in a fallen world. It's full of death. But death is outside of God's creational and Edenic ideal. It's part of the curse and the fall into sin. And so it's not fitting with God's Edenic perfect presence there. And so God is teaching Israel to be highly sensitized to this in all of life. The second theme in this part is the ground swarmers. So these are the animals that are swarming around in the dirt. So look at verses 29 to 31 with me. It's mainly listing rodents and lizards. And these are unclean to you among the swarming things that swarm on the ground. The mole rat, the mouse, the great lizard of any kind, the gecko, the monitor lizard, the lizard, the sand lizard, and the chameleon. These are unclean to you among all that swarm. And so then more listed in verses 
41 to 43, goes beyond rodents and lizards. Every swarming thing that swarms on the ground is detestable. It shall not be eaten. Whatever goes on its belly and whatever goes on all fours or whatever has many feet, any swarming thing that swarms on the ground, you shall not eat for they're detestable. You shall not make yourselves detestable with any swarming thing that swarms and you shall not defile yourself with them and become unclean through them. So what's wrong with these? Well, I think the best explanation is that they're associated very closely with the cursed ground. Remember in Genesis 3, God cursed the ground because of humanity's sin. So all these animals crawl on the ground, travel through the dirt, swarm around in the dirt. And notice one animal in particular. Did you hear it in verse 42? It refers to whatever goes on its belly. What animal goes on its belly? Yeah. There's only two places where that phrase is used in the Old Testament. The other one is Genesis 3, 14, when God is giving the curses. It's referring to the serpent when he was cursed. God said to the serpent, Satan kind of embodied in a certain serpent, on your belly you shall go. So the serpent is a ground swarmer. Israel's not to associate with animals that are too much like the serpent and whose living and traveling is through the dirt. So here's what we're seeing. Israel is to avoid animals that are abnormal and don't fit the creational ideal. They're to avoid animals that are associated with death or any animal once it's dead and it's just out there. They're to avoid animals that are associated with the cursed ground and the serpent, the instigator of sin. In other words, they're to associate then with the animals that most perfectly fit a creational Edenic ideal. Why? Because God is now with them in the tabernacle. The tabernacle, this symbolic realm of a perfect creation in their midst, a a realm of life, not death. A realm of holiness, God's presence. Israel is a new humanity surrounding the tabernacle of this new Eden. And so they're to be holy as God is holy. They're to be sensitive to the effects of the fall all around them. The end of the chapter then gives us two explicit reasons to pursue this holiness. God says to avoid all these unclean things because of his character and because of his grace. Look at verses 44 and 45. For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. You shall not defile yourselves with any swarming thing that crawls on the ground. For I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. So Israel is to be holy because God is holy. God is, to be holy is to be set apart and devoted to God. And so God is holy, set apart, distinct, morally pure. And Israel is to be different than the other nations. They're to reflect something of God's holiness and devotion to God. And they're to be holy because of God's grace. God said he, he rescued them from slavery. He cleansed them through these offerings and sacrifices. And he said that they would be his holy people. And so they're to live with a grateful holiness. But it was all symbol laden. So what was the ultimate meaning of this then? If this is a symbolic holiness and it was temporary just for Israel and it's gone now for Christians, what, what's the meaning of it? It's the third point, how Jesus fulfills the food laws. So some Christians today think that we are to follow these food laws, and that's a mistake. Uh, These were given as a temporary setup to prepare people for Jesus. And Jesus came and fulfilled this true and deeper intention and direction toward which they were pointing all along. So here's four ways that Jesus brings this to fulfillment. Number one, Jesus now calls us to ethical holiness. So God taught Israel to distinguish between everything that went into their body. When Jesus came, he taught us to distinguish between the sins that come out of our body. In Leviticus, the focus is on what comes out of our mouths and what we touch with our hands and bodies. 
With Jesus, the focus is on what goes into your mouth and what you do with your body. So the food laws foreshadowed a time when people would have a deeper holiness that Israel was not given. So in Mark 7, Jesus taught people that true uncleanness is not a matter of what we eat. There's a deeper uncleanness. So listen to what he said. He said, hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And then he explained it. He said, do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him since it enters not his heart, but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean, or perhaps just simply thus cleansing the foods. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. From within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things, he said, come from within, and they defile a person. Jesus showed that our problem is not what goes into our bodies, but what comes out of our bodies, out of our heart. And this means we're all unclean and defiled. Israel needed to avoid association with these external effects of the fall and death in the cursed ground. But what if the deepest problem of the fall is within us and we can't get rid of it? What if our, it's our hearts, our, like our very thought life and values, and then how we live? We are defiled by what we think, by what we value by what we say, by what we do, and we can't get clean on our own. So second, Jesus makes us clean. When Jesus came, this is one of the things he was doing. He was cleansing those who were unclean. He touched corpses, but when he did, they didn't, he didn't become unclean from them. They became alive. Remember when he grabbed that little girl's hand when she was already dead? And he said, little girl, rise, and she did. And he wasn't unclean by that. She was made alive. And he died and was buried as an unclean corpse. But through that, he defeated death and its curse, and he rose to life. And so he is the one who was made unclean so that you and I can be cleansed by him. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if you're not yet a Christian, and you're still exploring who Jesus is, and even texts like this have been really confusing to you as you've approached the Bible, this is really at the heart of it. We have all separated ourselves from God through this kind of uncleanness that Jesus talked about. It's what comes out of our hearts, but Jesus came to cleanse us. So if you want to become a Christian, what you do is you come to Jesus with your heart. You come to him in prayer and you ask him for this cleansing. You say, please cleanse me. I have defiled myself in the way that I've lived and that's my main problem in life. Would you forgive me and cleanse me all the way in? Third, third way he fulfills this is he brings God's presence to us. Israel had God's presence among them and with them in the tabernacle, but now Jesus sends the Spirit to be in us. If you are trusting Christ, you have been cleansed by Him, and now you are the holy and cleansed dwelling place of God. And this isn't just kind of like an allegorical thing. It's like, oh, look, the tabernacle's God's presence. I have an idea. I'll talk about how the Spirit's kind of God's presence. This is actually what the whole point of the tabernacle was. Jesus fulfilled it by sending the Spirit out to fill His people as the new temple tabernacle dwelling place of God, as the new Edenic holy dwelling place of God on our way to the new creation when everything will be renewed, and as Revelation says, no unclean thing shall enter it. 
It begins now with the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives. And this is why, fourth, Jesus calls us to holiness. It's another way he brings us to fulfillment. He calls us to holiness. Israel needed to pursue a symbolic holiness because of God's presence with them. We now pursue true holiness because God's presence is in us. 2 Corinthians 6, in that text, Paul says that we are now the temple, tabernacle of the living God. And therefore, he says this, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing a holiness to completion in the fear of God. I mean, if you're kind of a write in your Bible person, just write 2 Corinthians 7.1 in your margin there. Let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. So he, that's continuing on from 2 Corinthians 6. So you can read chapter 6 and on into 7 when he makes this point. And then he says in his previous letter, 1 Corinthians 6, flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. So you see how the thought world of the New Testament works. We are God's presence, holy presence, so then we pursue ethical holiness. God's people, individually and then all together as His church, are the dwelling place of God. His holy presence is here, and so Jesus calls us to live lives of holiness. So those are four ways that Jesus fulfills this text. So finally, how do we live in holiness today? So here's four aspects of the holiness that we are now called to pursue. So the lesson isn't just um, to worship Jesus and thank Him for the inner cleansing, but it's to pursue now this new holiness that's possible by His Spirit. So here's four aspects of the holiness that if you're a follower of Jesus, He calls you to pursue actively and intentionally in your life. The holiness is moral, pervasive, missional, and grateful. So it's a moral holiness. So we don't distinguish between clean and unclean animals anymore. We distinguish between holy and unholy thoughts, words, and actions. Peter quoted this chapter. He quoted Leviticus 11 and applied it to the lives of Christians. So he says this in 1 Peter 1, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, Leviticus 11, you shall be holy for I am holy. So you see what Peter does? He takes Leviticus 11 and then he says, Christian, you must pursue holy because he's holy and you pursue it in all your conduct. So what's the positive vision of holiness? Ultimately, I mean, the New Testament uses all sorts of words for this, um, holiness being one of them. And ultimately, it's about becoming like Jesus. He's the holy one. And so we become like him. If you want to know what the holiness of God looks like in human flesh, it's Jesus. He's the whole point of Christian growth. We don't focus on eating or avoiding certain symbolically charged foods, but we focus on becoming more like Jesus. All of us have to be careful about this um, to recognize that this is a moral holiness and not a symbolic holiness. So we need to be careful that we don't start creating our own versions of symbolic holiness. A lot of people do this. Uh, Cults do this. Families do this. Churches do this. They start setting up their own lists of things that have the effect of making people feel clean or unclean. It has to do with diet sometimes for some people or music preferences or class or personalities. All of us have to be careful about this. The more passionate you are about something, even a good thing, the more you can start to judge other people for not seeing the way you do. And then you don't want to be around them and you start separating from them and you start thinking that you are holier than other people because you're doing this thing you made up. So the thing we should be most passionate about is Jesus and becoming like him. And think about it. He is the one reality that actually if we do become passionate about becoming like Him, we don't kind of look down upon other people. We express compassion toward them. 
and love toward them and extend the welcome of Christ toward them because that's Jesus. So it's a moral holiness. It's also, second, a pervasive holiness. So this is for all of life. That was the point of the assignment that the students were given in that Leviticus class. And that was they learned, what they learned by trying to obey all these laws, they realized that every aspect of life all day long mattered. Now that Christ has come, we don't say, oh, good. We don't have to care about all of life anymore. Just the opposite. We see that it matters more than we may have thought. Every aspect of life all day long is an opportunity to pursue holiness and to become like Jesus. We're to seek holiness in everything. Our words are to be holy. Every conversation you have is an opportunity to reflect Jesus or show something that's the opposite of Him. So, will you criticize? Will we gossip? Will we lie? Or will we very intentionally seek to honor and encourage and speak truth where needed? Our thoughts are to be holy. The Holy Spirit is with us And that means that every thought we have is in His presence. Every meal you have is an opportunity for holiness. So, not because we we distinguish between clean and unclean foods in this ritual way anymore, but because we now are to eat with thanksgiving. And we don't undereat or overeat. Both of those can be unholy, right? Undereating because we're trying to fit some kind of ideal body type to fit our culture, or overeating because we use food as a comfort in trial instead of going to the Lord Jesus. So, we, pers- we pursue our meals and eating as ways of expressing thanksgiving and being holy before God. We don't look to food to be a coping mechanism when we're sad. We use it as a way of expressing thankfulness to God and to express generosity to others as an opportunity for hospitality. So, it's a pervasive holiness. Third, it's a missional holiness. The original food laws ended up having the effect of separating Israel from the nations, and that was part of their function. So Israel was viewed as cleansed because God rescued them and because of the offering. And then they ate foods then that were clean, that were fitting. The nations outside of and far away from the tabernacle presence of God, those were viewed as unclean, so they could eat the unclean foods. In fact, even if some of the foods among Israel, they weren't allowed to eat as Israelites, it even says they can give it to the foreigners among them because they don't have the same standards. There was a separation here. But when Jesus came, he got rid of those boundaries. Jewish people could eat with non-Jewish people without any problem. They could eat bacon together. And this means that people from every nation need the cleansing and can have the cleansing from Jesus. The Apostle Peter was the first to learn this lesson in a big way. God gave him a vision. This is in Acts chapters 10 and 11, this vision of a sheet coming down. And there were unclean animals all over the sheet, according to Leviticus 11. But then the point of the vision that the Lord communicated to him was that you shall no longer view anything as unclean. Rise and eat. Go for it. And the point of the vision was to encourage Peter to go share Jesus with a Gentile named Cornelius, who Peter was not to view as unclean or be separate, separate from. So he goes to Cornelius, his house, and he says, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So those food laws that separated Jews from Gentiles are over. Our holiness is not symbolic, but moral. And so we take the gospel to people who are different from us, and we take the gospel to the nations through missions. Finally, this is a grateful holiness. Uh, How overwhelming would it be, this vision of holiness, if it weren't for Jesus' grace? If it was hard enough to keep the food laws, how in the world can we live with this weight of pursuing absolute holiness all day, every day, thought, word, and action, unless we have the grace of Jesus. The grace of Jesus to do two things, to cleanse us, the deepest part of us. That, that sin that you are most ashamed of, that maybe you've not even told anyone about, or maybe other people found out and it's ruined your reputation. 
Jesus offers cleansing of that sin. The deepest part of you, crack your heart open and let the flood of His mercy come and cleanse you. And then the other way that we have the grace of Jesus is He gives us the Holy Spirit, God's presence, not to kill us because we're not holy and don't belong in His presence, but that cleansing means the Spirit can be with us to actually empower us to become holy. And so we now actually can pursue holiness, not perfectly, but progressively and truly over a lifetime. And so God had rescued Israel from physical slavery. This is what He reminds them of at the end of Leviticus 11. I rescued you from slavery. I've taken you out of slavery, and I've brought you to be my holy people. So be holy because of my grace and because of my character. Jesus has rescued us from this deeper defilement of sin and our addiction to sin and the curse of death. And He's brought us now into His kingdom, and He says, and I'm giving you the Holy Spirit to empower you. So now you can be holy, for I'm holy. So be holy, for I'm holy. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank You for Your Word, and we we praise You for Leviticus 11. We recognize that this chapter that we can so quickly and easily dismiss as inaccessible to us or boring or merely irrelevant, your infinite wisdom and the wonder of grace is what was behind the writing of this chapter and your commands here. And so we receive it and its ultimate message, and we thank you so much for the cleansing you bring through Jesus and the holy life that you call us to live and empower us to live. And so we pray that you would make us continue to be a holy church and holy people, and that this would be attractive to the nations and to other men and women, boys and girls in our area here, and that they would find cleansing as well. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.